My name is Kathy, Kathy Marshall, and I've been living in Ethiopia for the last 18 years. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was very much involved in starting this company, which is called Sabahar. The uh, objectives of Sabahar were really two when we started. One was to create uh, employment for artisans, for Ethiopians, from vulnerable households that didn't have secure livelihoods. The second objective really was to work with these artisans to create beautiful products that we could sell around the world and then people would wear them and say, wow, this is from Ethiopia, this is so lovely. It's a little bit to change the image that the world has about Ethiopia, I think. So um, we became, I think, uh, it was very fortunate that at the time of wanting to start this company, silk was just introduced into Ethiopia and uh, the production of silk and then all of the steps in creating beautiful textiles are very labor intensive. So it really helped us meet our first objective of creating employment because it takes a lot of manual work um, to create textiles. Again, the, um, the concept of creating textiles out of silk was so appropriate for Ethiopia because there's a long history of textile production in Ethiopia, probably thousands of years people, men and women in Ethiopia have been spinning cotton and weaving and they have a very rich tradition of beautiful designs that they know. So adding silk into this rich textile tradition um, makes a lot of sense. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about the silk cycle because we're involved, as a company, we're involved in actually all of the steps in the value chain. Um, and the first step, of course, is just the producer of the silk. And that's where I can introduce you to these lovely silkworms, um, caterpillars actually. So here you have this lovely, friendly guy. Yeah. These are airy silkworms. Some of you may have seen silk being produced in Asia and it was from the mulberry <laughs> silkworm. And they look quite different. These are airy silkworms. They can be in different colors, it doesn't matter because their silk is still the same. They are originally from Northeast India, Assam, Nagaland area, and they are, they produce what's called a wild silk because they used to be in the wild. There's a number of reasons why this kind of silk is really appropriate for Ethiopia. One is that the worm itself, the caterpillar, is very disease resistant. So as you see, I'm just picking it up and we have school children come and we give a whole education program about the silkworm and the worms don't get disease and die easily. So that's a good attribute of this, of airy silk. Another very um, important characteristic is the silk that they spin. They're cocoons. This, the silk, airy silk, needs to be spun. And I'm going to show you in a minute when we look at the women spinning. So again, it creates a lot of hand labor to process. These are the full-grown silkworms and you can see that they're eating castor leaves. And that's another reason why this is a good silk for Ethiopia, because castor plant is indigenous to Ethiopia. It grows in a lot of different environments. It's a, a strong plant and basically is the favorite food of these beautiful worms. And they're very happy to be Ethiopian worms now. They used to be Indian worms, they're Ethiopian worms. So as a company, we work in close cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture. We do training with women's groups. Uh, with individual households, with cooperatives um, around the country to produce this silk for us. Of course, it's a slow process to introduce a new sector into an agricultural economy. So <clears throat> it's taking some time to get uh, enough silk for us. So in the meantime, we are importing some silk from Uganda and from India so we can get our production and get our relationships with overseas buyers strong and gradually we hope that the Ethiopian silk can replace all of our imported silk in the future. So that was the first step, the worms. And like I mentioned, we have worms here because we do training. We give them out to women who want to produce silk in their own homes. Plus we do a lot of education programs. But for our process, our production process, the next step is spinning those cocoons into silk. And that's why we have all these women here, um, all these women 
are expert spinners. They've grown up uh, probably since they were young girls spinning cotton on traditional drop spindles. Um, and now um, we've just changed the technology a little bit by introducing these spinning wheels, which are from Canada and New Zealand, but there's spinning wheels in a lot of places. And I think an interesting story is that the women were very hesitant to move from a drop spindle to a spinning wheel at first, because um, they thought they couldn't master it. But once they were shown how, they were very, very, very proud now, and of course making greater income because they can spin faster on a spinning wheel. And their quality of silk is wonderful. Um, they're really expert. As I mentioned, Ethiopia has a long tradition of, of spinning. So um, the uh, possibility of creating employment for women by spinning silk is very, very, very high because nearly all the girls that grow up in Ethiopia know how to spin when they're young. So you can see the women, they're taking the cocoons. She's got the cocoons that she softened up by boiling in water there. So they look a little different than the dry cocoon. And now what she'll do is just fluff them up. It kind of looks like cotton when airy silk is all fluffed up. So she'll just fluff them up. It'll make it a little bit easier to and faster for her to do the spinning. So there's silk production is very laborious. It takes a lot of hands. It takes a lot of time for the hands to work. Um, but it's, it's work that the women are respected for in Ethiopia, and they're proud of the good quality of spinning that they can do. So, we just come from the spinners, and you saw how the women were making this lovely silk thread. So the next step in production of textiles is weaving, of course. And weaving, as I mentioned before, is extremely old tradition in Ethiopia, and the weaving is done by men. There's no taboo for women to weave, but it, traditionally the division of labor was women would spin the cotton and men would weave. So I think it's a nice division of labor that they're sharing that work. We work with, um, we have quite a few weavers here. Our property and our building is only so big, so we have about eight weavers here. But we have about 50, sometimes up to 60 weavers weaving in their own homes, and we've helped them create little micro businesses, which is something I'm really uh, uh, happy about, because um, I think in the long term, even if there is no subpar, these men will have sustainable businesses on their own. So here we have Haptamu. <laughs> Haktamu is weaving some beautiful blue tablecloths. He is using cotton and silk dyed in different colors. And the only difference, Haktamu has been a weaver probably his great grandfather. And his great grandfather before that was a weaver. The only difference is weaving to see some baby like this. Big looms are important for producing larger products, such as tablecloths and blankets and um, um, even pillows. It, they'll make a harder weave, so it's a firmer fabric. So these are, this is also a This is on a uh, cotton warp, and he's going to be weaving silk across. Combining silk and cotton, especially because he took this that lovely cotton, is a really um, great advantage that we have here. Um, Adiot, on a traditional loom, and it's the traditional loom because it has a bamboo reed. And again, I, I can safely say that people have been weaving on looms like this in Ethiopia for, for thousands of years. The technology hasn't changed much, and we've only had to do some small adaptations to make silk weaving uh, easy to do. So all of these Adiot are all traditional weavers. They all learn from their fathers and they learn from their brothers. It's a really um, a skill that's been passed on for generations. So from the weaving, we get our beautiful finished product and of course the next step is dye. With our silk, we use natural dyes. So as much as possible, we're using like, eucalyptus trees and flowers that we find in Ethiopia. Even the famous Ethiopian coffee we use for dyeing, um, and the national flower of Ethiopia is a lovely color. 
Um, we also use uh, normal reactive dyes for our cottons, for our tablecloths, napkins, things like that, so they're very washable. But for example, this is silk and cotton, and this was dyed with uh, natural color, and then afterwards it was dyed in cochineal, which is an insect that's also being produced in Ethiopia by a man from Peru. It's a very strong red color that's been used for for centuries for dyeing. So it's a very lovely uh, natural color. Over here, we combined so we combined some cochineal color with probably a yellow, probably a mescal flower or marigold to get kind of a tangerine color. So natural dyes are very fun to work with, um, safe for the environment, um, have a long history in Ethiopia, but can be variable in terms of the getting results all the time. So that's about it for the cycle of our scarves, of our textiles. I think you've seen everything from the beginning with the hardworking worms to the hardworking people and to still the hardworking women here. Um, we're very excited that we're going to be expanding our relationship with the Desert Flower Foundation. We're going to be marketing in various countries in Europe with their label. So you will, may see the Sabahar tag on a scarf and you will see the Desert Flower tag beside it. And now that you know the whole story and how your purchase of a scarf will help um, so many people in Ethiopia to have a good, reliable income, um, we hope that you'll just feel the compassion to buy these beautiful products from Ethiopia.